Who are the- okay, hello, hello world. I hope you are as excited as I am about Dr. David Fell's world premiere book launch of his third single authored book, Taiwan's Green Parties. Welcome everyone to this exciting book launch event at the Center of Taiwan Studies in the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS. My name is Jua Lo. I'm one of the first people to read and check the final manuscript of this book. And I observed much of the book's field work over the last eight years. So when today's speaker, the book author, um, Dr. Vell asked if I'd like to introduce him at his world's first book launch of Taiwan Screen Parties, I happily and proudly accepted the invitation. Dr. David Fell is the director of the Center of Taiwan Studies at SOAS. He has published many articles about Taiwan. He has edited and co-edited books about Taiwan. He has written books about Taiwan. And today we are celebrating the launch of his third single authored book, about Taiwan Spring Parties. I'm from Taiwan myself, and I'm very pleased for Taiwan that there are many scholars working pretty hard for Taiwan outside of Taiwan. Dr. Fell is one of the hardworking scholars. His most remarkable achievements in Taiwan studies outside of Taiwan are, firstly, he helped establish European Association of Taiwan Studies, EATS, Yes, EADS started at and from SOAS. Secondly, he has developed comprehensive Taiwan studies programs at SOAS. Thirdly, he has been editing the research on Taiwan book series. Next then I move to the empirical chapter. The series has 37 books published. Last time I counted, including the forthcoming ones. With With all these um, amazing accolades under his belt, one may wonder why he decided to write a book about Taiwan's green parties. We will soon find out in his talk later. Since I have the honor to have um, read the book, here are some of my humble thoughts about his latest page turner. One of the good things living with an academic is you get to know- Able to attract. Both domestic. When writing a PhD thesis, you have to have a set of crystal clear research questions and a rock solid framework for organizing your research materials and writing your thesis. The book has followed what Dr. Fell has always preached. On top of that, he has managed to give each well thought through chapter, an interestingly attractive title. All the effort he put into writing the book has made reading this academic book thoroughly enjoyable. The book has been written with great sincerity. He has told the stories, as he as he tells the stories in detail, you can get a clear picture of how the Green Parties have developed in Taiwan, and the development can provide valuable lessons for any alternative political parties. Now, enough from the book author's wife talking about the book. Let's hear Dr. Fell's speech on his latest masterpiece. Over to you, Dr. Fell. Fantastic. Um, uh, Thanks to you all for that kind introduction. Uh, can you all see the uh, PowerPoint now? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So welcome to this book launch of Taiwan's Green Parties, Alternative Politics in Taiwan. Um, so it's a kind of a, a very special occasion for, for me. This is um, essentially it's my second PhD book. Um, my first book um, uh, came out of my PhD, and for an academic, it's very hard to get out of the shadow of the first PhD book once we get into um, regular academic life with pressures of teaching and administration. Um, I 
so, as soon as I finished my, my first book, I started out on my uh, second PhD style book, um, but it was a, a failed book project after uh, five, six years. Um, and so um, today's a special occasion to actually achieve that uh, second style PhD book. It's not entirely out of the shadow of the first book. To a certain extent, I'm building on the first book. Um, but I think in some ways, um, I think I've improved on what I managed in the first uh, book. I, th I think a further thing I would add about the um, the book um, is that the book has a very strong SOAS flavor. If you've been involved in Center of Taiwan Studies events over the last uh, 10 years, you'll have met many of the characters that feature um, in the book. Um, in the book, I interview about 50 uh, Green Party uh, figures. And I think something like 17 or 18 of them uh, have appeared at SOAS, either on uh, Green Party and Trees Party delegations, but also as speakers. So we've been able to host speakers from a range of Taiwanese social movements, uh, including uh, the feminist, environmental, indigenous, um, and LGBT rights movements. Um, and many of those um, activist scholars um, have spoken about their uh, activism at, uh, at SOAS. Because this is a, a book launch, I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail uh, into the content of the book, but I'm gonna try and give you a taste of what I've tried to do um, in, this, um, in this book. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna first talk a little, little bit about how I ended up writing a book on uh, Taiwan's alternative parties. I'll talk a little bit about the research questions that I used to structure um, my analysis. And I'll talk about some of the uh, research material and field work that's made this project such an enjoyable uh, one. Um, I'll talk briefly about the uh, chapter structure and just um, talk a little bit about a couple of the stories that uh, feature in the various chapters. And then lastly, I'll talk a little bit about um, um, what I plan to do next uh, with this project. Um, sometimes when we finish a book project, we want to move on to something new, but I'm not quite ready uh, to move on to something new. So how did I end up writing a book on Taiwan's um, uh, green parties? Well, my interest on Taiwan's small parties began on some of my earliest visits uh, to Taiwan, both as a student and in my early years working in Taiwan. And in those years, at the early period of Taiwan's democratization, a number of movement parties uh, first appeared on the scene. And a number of these were uh, labor-linked political parties. So this kind of caught my initial uh, interest. But it wasn't really until I started my uh, PhD that I started to go into the subject of Taiwan's small parties in more depth. Um, my first book, Party Politics in Taiwan, looked at the um, evolution of three political parties uh, between 1991 and 2004. These included two mainstream parties, DPP and the KMT. But the third party case was the new party. And I kept um, being quite puzzled at why my explanatory frameworks that work for the big parties didn't work so well for the small party, the new party. Why would the party act um, in a way that seemed irrational and seemed like electoral suicide? So after I finished my uh, first book, uh, I, my, I made my first attempt to kind of make sense of the evolution of Taiwan's small parties in a journal article in 2005 that talked about the evolution of Taiwan's new or small parties. Um, and when I started writing the current Green Party's book, I went back and looked at that first article and found that um, I devoted a, f um, a couple of short paragraphs to the early history of the Taiwan uh, Green Party. But I think at that point, I think it was it was still unimaginable that I would end up um, uh, spending um, nine years working on a project on something that was really m no more than a footnote um, in uh, these uh, early writings. 
the key kind of turning point came in um, uh, in 2012. Um, and it was the result of a random email from one of my former students, uh, Yuan Ru. Um, and she'd formerly been a SOAS student in anthropology. And, and I'd been quite um, amazed to see that this student within months of graduating from SOAS had gone on to stand for a national parliament in Taiwan for the Green Party. Um, and in October 2012, she sent me an email asking if I would share news about a Australian Green Party uh, research uh, fund um, to see if any of any of our students would be interested in bidding for this um, this fund. Um, I thought the project looked really interesting, so I decided to uh, design a project that looked at the Taiwan uh, Green Party together with a Taiwanese academic and former Green Party leader, uh, Peng Yanwen. And although we were not successful at getting the funding from the Australian Greens, um, we did decide to go ahead with our planned uh, research project. And that was to hold a couple of um, focus groups to um, um, look at the initial development of the Taiwan uh, Green Party. Uh, the focus groups included um, figures that had been involved since the party's foundation in the mid 1990s and those that had been involved in the most recent election at that point in time in January of 2012. Um, and if I still had some doubts, the focus groups really left me hooked on the subject. Uh, it was so different from dealing with mainstream parties. Um, the um, um, passion, idealism, anger that I saw in these focus groups really left me uh, fascinated um, and gave me a huge amount of, de of data to start the, uh, the project. Now, of course, we also need academic justifications for engaging in any uh, research project. And one of the, the ways that I've tried to deal with this topic is to um, link the Taiwan case with broader comparative literature on small and movement political parties. Um, and when I go through the research questions, I'll talk about how I try to make those uh, connections. There's also a qu quite a large literature on global green parties. And again, um, um, uh, I'm trying to engage with some of those theories. Do the kind of theories that have mainly evolved from European small and green parties work for a, um, a Taiwanese uh, case? Another of my academic justifications is that I wanted to try to bring a different perspective on the way we understand Taiwan's civil society and uh, party system. Um, and even though the uh, the book is focused on the um, um, Green Party as well as some of the um, uh, its kind of linked political groupings, um, I'm always trying to engage with uh, topics of civil society and uh, the uh, the party system. Um, a lot of the literature that I've read on um, Green Parties in Europe. Uh, hasn't been particularly um, uh, exciting. Often it's been a little bit dry and dull. And what I've tried to do is to bring in the flavors um, and the human stories of Taiwan's Green Parties. Um, and I'm hoping that readers will be uh, enjoy these stories and be moved by the huge sacrifices that the participants um, in this uh, struggle for environmental and social justice uh, have paid. Okay, let me then come on to the big research questions which really drive uh, this project. Um, uh, they're a little bit different from those that um, um, I used for my first book, Party Politics in Taiwan. So Party Politics in Taiwan looked at a how question, in other words, how the main parties had changed, a, a why question which looked at why they'd changed, and a so what question, which looked at the implications of those changes. In the case of this new book, uh, I've been a little bit more ambitious. 
not only in the time I, I cover, which is the first 24 years, but I try to cover more questions. Um, and so the first question is a how question. So I'm interested in how the party has changed uh, over its um, uh, 24 uh, year history. My who question really focuses on what kind of people have led the party and represented the party um, over the years, but also what kind of people have supported the party. Then I have my so what questions. And here I'm focusing on mainly focusing on two dimensions. I'm focusing on the uh, electoral impact of the uh, of the parties. But I also look at the international engagement. In other words, I'm looking at the way that the Green Party has engaged with other Green Parties uh, within this global Greens and Asia Pacific Greens uh, network. Um, and then I come to my why questions and I have uh, three core why questions. Um, a small why question I have is to explain party formation. Um, the next uh, big why question tries to explain party change. So why do we see changes in organization? Why do we see changes in the uh, issue focus of the party? And then the, the final why question, which I probably devote the most space to, is trying to explain uh, the electoral performance of the Green Party. So all these questions allow us to engage with international comparative um, theories and frameworks. Um, and I think it also shows, I think it's a key challenge that we have when we do Taiwan studies, is how do we make our project interesting to audiences beyond Taiwan? And that's the reason why I do try to uh, engage with these uh, theoretical approaches. OK, what I'm going to do next then is talk about some of the um, research material that I've used to answer these questions. Um, and um, and I think it's one of these reasons why I've really enjoyed this um, uh, this um, this work. Um, firstly, we have uh, focus groups. This was something that I hadn't done uh, for my uh, earlier uh, work. Um, and it was something that I really enjoyed and generated a huge amount of fantastic data that features very heavily um, in the book. Um, I did focus groups both for um, uh, party leaders and activists, but I also did focus groups for um, party members, both in Ga the Gaussian branch and the uh, Taipei uh, branch. Um, the second um, uh, type of data that features very heavily is interviews with um, um, party supporters, um, party leaders and party candidates. Um, when it comes to party figures, I did something, I've interviewed something like 50 figures. However, what made this project different from my earlier work was that I interviewed a number of these party figures multiple times during the eight years that I was working on the project. Um, most of the uh, interviews were done face to face and it was only in the final part of the project when I um, was based in the UK and I was trying to analyze the 2020 election that I did quite a lot of uh, online um, interviews. Uh, we also did a number of um, um, in-depth supporter interviews um, and in 2016, we also did a online survey um, of uh, party supporters. Um, and here I'm often using the term we because at the um, first stage of this project, I was working very closely with a Taiwanese professor and former party leader, uh, Pong Yewen. Um, and the first couple of um, publications that came out of this project uh, were co-authored. OK, uh, another really wonderful uh, data set, again, that I didn't use um, in uh, in my first book was Central Election Commission uh, databases. And here particularly useful were the election gazettes. And, and I've got an example of an election gazette from the 2020 um, um, uh, Taiwanese election where we see the party's policy proposals, the candidates names, their ages, uh, where they're born, their education, and their experience. And uh, ebook. The ebook, I think, 
answer questions of um, how the party's changed um, and who the party is, these electoral gazettes were extremely useful material because we could look at uh, multiple years electoral uh, gazettes. Um, OK. Um, a further source that was um, uh, useful that again wasn't really available for my first book was online sources. We have party websites, for example. Um, uh, we have a huge amount of data from candidate and party uh, social media. Candidate blogs were also extremely um, uh, useful. For example, Panson's uh, blog um, was very useful for some of the um, middle term uh, election campaigns. Uh, and also there was a huge amount of audiovisual material available as a result of um, uh, YouTube. So I could look at um, uh, party news uh, items. And again, it meant um, even if for elections where I hadn't uh, been on the spot, I could get a feel of these uh, campaigns. Now, one item that does um, tie with my uh, first book was political advertising analysis. Uh, and again, I try to bring as much of this as possible when I'm looking at the party's communication strategies. Uh, for example, I looked at um, party posters, such as this one from 2008, with the slogan, uh, "When I, um, after I grow up, I want to save the world with the Green Party. And on the, the right, we have a 2016, uh, a clip from the Green Party's 2016 um, TV election. Uh, ad one that a lot I think a lot of my students have um, uh, seen me uh, analyzing uh, over the uh, the years. So here we can get a sense about the um, the kind of appeals that the party's been making, both environmental, uh, but also uh, gender related uh, appeals. What about the writing then? How how did the writing um, uh, evolve? Again, I think this is a, it's something quite um, uh, important. It's something that. Um, both as PhD students, but also as um, established academics, we often really struggle uh, with. Um, why did it take me so long to go from uh, December of 2012 to um, uh, finishing the book in um, um, late 2020? In the initial stage, um, I published a couple of journal articles uh, that looked at the early development of the party uh, quite broadly, together with Peng Yenwen. But I kind of felt that um, our data was so rich that we really had more than enough for a, uh, a book project. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to persuade uh, Dr. Peng to join me for the, uh, the book um, project. And um, I kept uh, delaying starting uh, writing the book. Originally, I'd hoped to um, finish the book at the 2016 election, um, and eventually it got delayed to the 2020 election, which was not so bad as it allowed me to cover a very different campaign. After thinking about the project for uh, so long, um, when I actually came down to writing it, um, the process was surprisingly smooth. Um, I'd been on a EasyJet flight in October of 2019, uh, maybe because there was no screen, uh, I suddenly worked out my um, book structure. And to a large extent, the book structure is, um, with a few slight revisions, is almost the same to the one that I drew up on that short EasyJet um, flight. And when I actually started the writing, um, it went quite smoothly. So I think I probably wrote most of the book um, in, November 2019 through to January 2020, with a, a, a couple of other short um, writing uh, periods in March of 2020. And then after the uh, the, the uh, first book reviews came in, um, I then um, did some adjustment, some revisions, and I added the final two chapters, the 2020 election uh, and my concluding uh, chapter. OK, let me now then move on and briefly talk about um, uh, each of the main um, chapters. Um, chapter two really goes over the uh, frameworks 
um, and reviews the literature where I'm locating um, uh, my book. So I talk about the explanatory frameworks for my key uh, research questions. I'm not going to really go into those in uh, in this session. I'm going to jump straight into um, chapter three, which is called Beautiful Accidents. Um, um, this term comes from party one of the party founders comments about why the party were the Green Party was first formed in 1996. But as you've noticed, the book title is Green Parties. So in this chapter, I talk about the formation of three parties, the Green Party in um, 1996, in January 1996, the Trees Party in the summer of 2014. And I also talk about a um, forgotten Green Party um, that was established in the summer of 1995. Uh, I was attracted by a footnote in Hermin Shou's book about a early attempt to create a Green Party. And I started to look in detail and found this actually received quite a lot of media attention in Taiwan in the summer of 1995. Uh, the party even had a founding uh, ceremony and uh, TV uh, coverage, but it was a stillborn Green Party. It never registered with the Ministry of Interior. But for me, it was a really interesting uh, story because the concept behind this failed Green Party was quite different from the subsequent Green Party that was founded um, six months uh, later. But once again, in this chapter, uh, I'm able to engage with theories of party formation but also theories of party switching, uh, because to a certain extent, the formation of the Trees Party is a splinter party out of the Green Party. So again, that allows me to engage with a different uh, set of um, um, conceptual uh, theories to link the Taiwan uh, case. If I was asked about my favourite chapter, then I think this one is probably it may well be my my favorite chapter, partly because at the time of party formation, there's so much hope uh, for the future. Nothing has gone wrong uh, yet. The next chapter looks at the impact, um, and I mainly look at the impact of the Green Party through two angles. Uh, one is terms of in terms of the electoral impact. So here I'm looking at the electoral record. And again, this allows us to look at the consequences of Taiwan's electoral system. Um, so, for example, um, I look at Hans voters who were particularly worried. This um, candidate on the left, Gao Mengding, was elected in the Green Party's first um, National Assembly election just um, weeks after the party had been uh, established. And um, but I also talk about the international uh, impact of the Green Party. And I think one of the things that I found really interesting is that sometimes when the Green Party was electorally quite quiet, it actually is, was very active internationally. Um, and I also found that a lot of Green Party figures found the international engagement particularly uh, meaningful compared to domestic politics. And here we have an example of where the Green Party delegation came to SOAS in the spring of uh, 2017. Um, the international engagement enables Taiwan to um, engage internationally in a way that is often prevented from doing so as a result of uh, China's diplomatic uh, pressures. And um, one of my favorite stories um, uh, in the book concerns the um, uh, the way that the England and Wales Green Party um, helped the, the uh, Taiwan Green Party in its first election. And one of the stories I tell in the international section is about how um, um, Penny Kemp from the England and Wales Green Party visited Taiwan during that first election campaign at a time when Taiwan was um, um, in the cross-strait crisis of 1995-1996. Uh, and this is one of the things that um, I hope to um, uh, write on um, uh, in more detail about this uh, kind of forgotten side of UK-Taiwan uh, 
uh, relations. In chapter five, I look at the who question. In other words, I look at uh, who are the Green parties? Who are their leaders? Who are their candidates? And who are their uh, supporters? Um, and I felt this was quite important to get a sense of the personalities that we're going to look at in the subsequent empirical uh, chapters. Um, so one of the really difficult decisions was who to include, um, which um, um, uh, personalities uh, should I include? And in this picture, we see two of the uh, personalities who uh, I chose to focus on. One of them is Linda Arrigo, who has visited SOAS, and I think many of you will um, um, uh, know quite well, who was heavily involved in the Green Party in the, uh, the first um, period from the mid 1990s through to the early uh, 2000s, helping develop the party's international uh, engagement. And then the, um, uh, the second on the right is party founder uh, Gao Chengyan, who had been um, blacklisted um, um, by the KMT in the uh, 1970s, 1980s, uh, as a result of his political activism in the US. Um, and um, he's a key figure in Taiwan's environmental movement in the early 1990s. Um, and he's the one Green Party figure that stood for election the most times. But of course, I also talk in this chapter about the kind of people that have supported um, uh, the party, as well as the kind of people the party has um, nominated. And overall, I think we can see that the party has tended to nominate um, more female candidates than other parties. Um, it's also the first party to nominate openly LGBT candidates. And it's also been more willing to nominate younger um, uh, politicians. OK, um, next then I move to the empirical chapters. And generally what I do in the empirical chapters is focus on a number of those key questions. The how question looks at the uh, how the party has changed. Uh, the why question tries to explain the electoral performance. Um, and um, the first, um, this chapter looks at the first uh, Green Party uh, election campaign in January of 19, in March of 1996. And I chose to call this Pre Professor Gall catching the missiles because one of the reasons, one of the ways uh, that the, uh, the Green Party was able to attract both domestic and international uh, attention was taken advantage of the cross-strait missile crisis of 1996. And Professor Gall went out into the missile uh, zone uh, to show, uh, to take a strong stand against the China threat. Um, and this was in fact one of the reasons why the global greens uh, in Europe um, first became aware of the uh, Taiwan Green Party because of the media attention um, uh, of uh, Professor Gao going to catch the missiles. So one of the things I do in this chapter is try to explain the variation in the Green Party candidates' electoral performance. Why does one get elected? Um, and why do some do pretty well and some do not quite so well? OK, then I move to uh, the second campaign in 1998, which is a local uh, election. Um, so even though there were national elections, the party focused on local county and um, uh, city council elections. Um, it's working with the Australian Green was um, why did the party generally do much worse two years later? Um, and why was one campaign particularly strong uh, network? The campaign that was particularly strong was that of my co-author, Peng Yenwen, who was almost elected to the Taipei City Council. And um, the reason why I call this, is it OK to frequent sexual nightclubs, was that uh, Peng's campaign it was a strong campaign with a strong campaign team. But one of the reasons why it was it was um, better than the other campaigns was it was able to take advantage of um, this issue about whether uh, it was OK to frequent, whether it was OK for politicians or civil servants to frequent sexual uh, nightclubs. And this helped her to get the necessary uh, media um, attention. And here we can see one of the um, uh, press conferences 
on this um, uh, this topic. The next chapter is rather different because it doesn't really focus on election campaigns because the Green Party only ran a, f a, a small number of token campaigns between 1999 and 2005. Instead, the focus is on why did the party collapse after 1998? Um, and then I focus on how Peng Yuan and a number of, of her colleagues were able to rebuild the party starting in 2004 and get it ready again to start uh, competing in uh, elections. And as with um, step down a uh, variety of perspectives and stories on each of these uh, these puzzles and then try to come to a conclusion about which ones are more persuasive. OK, uh, next then I move to uh, the way that the party returns to elections between 2006 and 2009. Um, and uh, again, each of my kind of subheadings have some meaning. Uh, for example, in 2008, about how active they are in alliance with a, a labor rights uh, group. And we see a, a news conference on the left here between the Green Party and a labor rights um, group. So it was known as the Red Green Alliance of 2008. Uh, and then um, we have a picture of the treetop pro protest from a, um, a by-election in 2009. But despite these efforts, uh, in these first um, three elections, the party is still uh, less successful electorally than it had been in the uh, 1990s. So again, the question is, how do we explain these patterns? And what I tend to do is look at a mixture of both uh, party system factors, but also I look at the uh, party agency, looking at the strategies that the party um, adopts. Um, then in the next chapter, I look at uh, the party's attempt to become a relevant political party with a set of organizational reforms. And we do see improved results in both the local elections in 2010 and the national elections in 2012. Um, it's also noteworthy that in 2010, the Green Party is the first party to openly to nominate openly LGBT candidates. So I think quite an important moment in the um, uh, the struggle for LGBT uh, rights. Um, in 2012, we um, see the party again contesting national elections, and much of the focus is on uh, Panson and his alliance in one district with the, I think there's a number of factors. However, for me, the, the campaign that I find most interesting in 2012 is that of um, uh, Jiang Yuji. And um, in this case, we have someone who's uh, really lacking resources. So we have a housewife environmentalist whose campaign consists of her two young daughters. And we see how um, she's still able to be one of the best uh, vote winners despite this lack of uh, resources. So for me, that was one of the most moving stories, um, uh, understanding the way that um, uh, she campaigned uh, with her young daughters. Okay, so then we move to um, a new round of organizational reform. The party leadership switches to uh, Li Genzhen, um, and we have an attempt to make the party much more institutionalized. Um, and we see this in the 2014 uh, local elections, which are much, the campaign is much better resourced. Um, and we start to get the first uh, breakthroughs at the uh, local level with um, uh, Zhou Jianjie and Wang Haoyu both getting elected. But overall, though, um, there was a sense of both um, um, congratulations, but also disappointment. Uh, because many of the candidates did less well than they'd expected. And also this new organizational uh, framework led to the party split that I discuss in um, uh, chapter uh, three. So this was one of the reasons why I chose to borrow the, um, the name of 
uh, Shotai Lin's film, Unfinished Progress, which was a documentary about uh, Wang Zhongming as my subheading. In other words, the progress had been made, but it was still not complete. And we see that in the 2016 campaign, when the Green Party works in alliance with the Social Democratic Party. However, despite this alliance, uh, it's unable to get a make a breakthrough and and only improves um, um, by a limited amount compared to 2012. In other words, it goes up from 1.7 to 2.5 percent of the vote. Um, despite the fact that it was an older party and it had been doing pretty well in the polls early in the uh, the campaign. Um, and as with the other empirical chapters, I look at a, a mixture of party system factors, such as the rise of the new power party and the DVP's um, strategies. But I also look at problems within the GBT's uh, campaign, including its poor handling of its relations with its ally, the Social Democratic uh, Party. Um, and, and of course, we do have the, uh, the China factor in the background of this campaign. Uh, and the teenage idol here I'm referring to is the uh, Zhou Ziyu uh, incident. OK, now I move to the 2018 election. This was the last campaign where I was actually able to be in Taiwan uh, for um, uh, for field work. Um, and once again, we have another round issue onto the thing and reorganization. Um, so I would, basically, we could say we have our third um, um, or fourth model. But this model of the Green Party is rather different. Um, and we can get a sense of this from the party leader uh, or the most influential party figure, Wang Haoyu's comment. This time, we're not just campaigning on ideals, we're campaigning to get elected. However, uh, for many Green Party supporters, it felt like the party was um, selling its soul. It was losing its ideals. For example, um, we have an alternative approach here, um, uh, alternative understanding. The people who are left don't really understand the Green Party's values or don't stress these values. They, call, they care more about political calculations and that can damage our reputation. So many long-term Green Party supporters began to have doubts about the direction the party was uh, moving uh, into uh, at this uh, point in time. So again, the party does do pretty well. It does slightly improve on its 2014 performance, but we can see that there's a price to this um, uh, new uh, approach. And then I come to the most recent election in January of 2020. Um, and I call it the Deng Huiwen or Wang Haoyu uh, campaigns. Because uh, these two figures, the controversial um, uh, Wang Haoyu and the um, uh, psychiatrist and media figure Deng Huiwen were the most visible figures in this uh, campaign. Originally, I had expected that party founder Gao Chengyan, who'd come back to stand, would be the focus. Um, and he did try to um, um, remind voters of what he did back in 1996, but also back in 1994, when he led a recall campaign against the 2020 uh, KMT presidential candidate, uh, Han Guoyu. However, his candidacy was really overshadowed by Deng and Wang. Um, and this chapter was quite a hard one for me to write because I was um, writing it during and doing the research during the campaign. And of course, I was at, um, doing this at distance. So it had to rely quite a lot on uh, online um, interviews. Um, it's a very complex campaign. And I think it's the first time that I've um, when I've been writing um, that I've talked about a Machiavellian plot. Um, and I remember uh, being really excited the first time that I used this term um, uh, to describe this um, uh, this chapter. So the puzzle for this chapter is why, despite losing so many former supporters, does the party still do almost the same as 2016? And I think the candidacy of Deng Huiwen uh, was a, a key factor. 
And then I come to my final concluding chapter where I, I look at what happened after the setback of 2020. How did the party recover after the controversial Wang Haoyu had left the party? How does it try to rebuild bridges? Uh, and lastly, I try to do something that I promised to do nine years ago, and that was to talk about some of the practical lessons uh, for the party. So when I first got the email from Yuan Ru in um, December, uh, October 2012, I said that this was something we would do. Um, and, and I've talked a little bit about some possible lessons based on uh, my observations over the last nine years. OK, so lastly, um, what am I going to do next? Um, well, the, the, um, this is the first of what will be a number of uh, book talks, um, uh, and I plan to um, uh, do some in, uh, in Europe and also in uh, American uh, universities. But another thing I really want to do with this book is to engage with Green Party audiences. So uh, I'm hoping to do some sessions with uh, local um, uh, Green Parties uh, in the future, because I believe that the book um, should have value beyond academic um, uh, audiences. And I also hope to uh, do some sessions um, in Taiwan uh, as well. The other thing that I'm very, very excited about is I'm now working on a Chinese version of the book, but it won't just be a translated um, uh, book. Uh, a DBP co-authors, um, Peng Yanwen, who I'm delighted has rejoined um, the project, and also Wang Yanhan, who spoke at SOAS in 2017. So both are, um, are former Green Party leaders. So my hope is that the new version of the book will bring in their perspective. It's been the shift has continued to be positive, uh, their experiences and uh, observations. And we're currently um, in the process of um, rewriting uh, this book. And hopefully we, we hope to finish um, uh, this uh, this year. So lastly, I, there's so many people I need to thank for making this book uh, possible. Um, in the acknowledgements, uh, I particularly highlight uh, three people. Uh, Peng Yewen, um, Yuan Ru, and of course, uh, Ju Law, who you saw opening today's uh, session, uh, who's helped me so much over the last um, nine years, including um, uh, checking the manuscripts. And whenever um, I heard, um, whenever she was checking the manuscripts and I heard her very loud laughter, I knew that I'd got it, I'd got that uh, part um, uh, right. So, um, now the book is coming it's only out in in hardback and uh, ebook the ebook i think is priced a little bit better um and we do have the book in the soas library so if you're a soas student you can get uh, access um, and please do encourage your local librarians to um, order uh, the book if you don't have access to the soas um, uh, library so the sooner i sell enough hardbacks then i can get the paperback um, out and um, and finally, um, uh, thanks everyone for, for listening. I know if you are so a student of mine, you've heard me talking about this project for uh, nine years um, and I've really um, uh, done it. So thanks for all your support uh, and thanks to all the Green Party figures for uh, helping me along the way. And let me finish here. Thank you. Thank you.